All right, well, we are in our series called Kingdom Culture. Last several weeks, uh, we've been going through and answering the questions, who are we and what do we do? Um, Who are we and what what do we do? We're looking at identity and purpose. Identity and purpose. Remember, wherever there's an identity crisis, there's most likely a purpose crisis. Um, You know, I know now, but I remember inheriting... A, a toolbox, I think second or third hand, was, I think it was my grandfather's, some of his collected tools, and there was this thing in there, it was just like a, it looked like a metal shell, like a cap or something, and inside it was just a bunch of pokey wire brushes, and I'm looking at this thing, and I can't even imagine, I, I have no clue what this is, and turns out later, someone informed me, it was a spark plug cleaner. You know, it has all these wire brushes on the inside, and it's like a cap that you put on a spark plug and clean it off. Right, Larry? (laughs) But I'm like, what in the world is this? And so if you don't know what something is, if you don't have your identity secured, most likely you will not have your purpose secured. You know, have you, we've all seen those funny memes or pictures on the internet where someone's using something completely for the wrong purpose, like, or, and, you know, it's, it's just humorous because they don't know what it's for. It's like, okay. Um, we want to know what we're about. We want it as, as believers, as followers of Christ, we want to be firm in our identity so we can thrive in what God's called us to do. Amen. So last few weeks, we've talked about how we are a hospital, place of restoration, healing, freedom, a family, place to grow and mature together. And last week, we talked about how we're the bride of Christ. We're a bride. Um, We are God's covenant people that he committed himself to, and we bear his name. Just like a bride bears her husband's name most often, it's like we bear the name of Christ. Amen? Amen? When God said, do not take the name of the Lord in vain, do not take my name in vain, he's not just, I mean, of course we don't want to use God's name as a cuss, right? But that's not even what it's talking about. It says, don't bear my name falsely. Don't claim that we are his people and act not as his people. Amen? It's bearing his name in vain. We bear our our husband's name. We are Christians. We are followers of Christ. Not only that, uh, but he's the one working in our lives, making us ready. You know, the Bible talks about how Christ is doing the work in the bride, which is the church, to present to himself a bride without spot, wrinkle, blemish. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit, Jesus, is the one making us holy? And not us? I mean, have you tried doing that recently? Or ever? Or always? You know, some of us are stuck trying to do that. We haven't stopped trying to do that. And it's not that we neglect the good things that we ought to do, but we, in and of our own efforts, can't make ourselves holy. We can't put ourselves into right standing with God. Only the blood of Christ washing us forgiving us, making us new, can put us in right standing with God. Amen? So we need to lean on him, because he's the one making us ready to meet him face to face. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? All right, we're talking about a kingdom culture. Who are we and what do we do? And today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to be in verse 10. talking about the armor of God. We're going to go through verse 10 through 17. And I think I've told many of you this story, but, you know, there was a time when I was a teenager. I was like 17 years old. I wanted a tattoo. A lot of you have heard this story. But I I wanted to go to school to be an artist, so I drew up this really cool, like, coat of arms, and I had Ephesians 6. And it was just, like, the coolest drawing I had ever done, obviously. And I was determined in my heart I was going to get that tattooed on my arm, forearm, bicep, whatever it was. Maybe the bicep, so when you flex, like the the sword and the shield move a little bit. But um, 
it was a really cool thing, and I remember telling my parents about it, my dad about it specifically. <laughs> and uh, he's like, no, nope, you're not. I'm like, what? So offended. I'm like, not while you're living at home, not going to get a tattoo. And I remember being so offended and purposing in my heart. I fell. I failed the test. I failed the temptation test because I remember walking away from that conversation going, I'm not going to listen to you. As soon as I, get, I turn 18, I'm going to get my cool tattoo drawing on, on me and it's going to be the best decision I've ever made. And, uh, <laughs> and I go back to my room that day and I'm like, well, I suppose if I'm going to do this, I should probably actually read the whole chapter. You know, because good... Good Christians read the whole chapter and not, not just a portion of it. If you notice, verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you. So, like I said, many of you have heard that. But I just remember reading that and saying, Huh, I closed my Bible put it on my bed, and I was like, I guess that's that. <laughs> so I don't have a tattoo. <laughs> Yet. I can't commit to a sticker. I can't put a sticker on a binder, let alone decide what I want forever on my body. I don't. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. Ephesians chapter 6, um, verse 10. We're going to read through verse 17. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand." Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith which, uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, verse 18, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, God, and I just pray that you would open our eyes and ears to what the Spirit is speaking today. God, I just pray that you would anoint me to rightly divide your word, Lord, that I'd speak your truth, Lord, that we would see and glean with what you have for us today. Lord, let it be seeds in our heart that would bear fruit, that would last in our lives and change us. God, we don't just want to flash in the pan, but equip us to walk rightly before you. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone said, Amen. 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 Um, I know I just shared my tattoo story, but I want to actually share you another, uh, another thing that happened when I was a, a kid. Our upstairs, the house that my parents still live in now, all of our, us kids, we had bedrooms upstairs. And the hallway upstairs, you'd walk up the stairs, and it's kind of meets in a corner, and the hallway is kind of a horseshoe. And we'd have bedrooms on this side, a bathroom in the middle, and then a bedroom on the other side. So there's two sharp corners in our hallway, and one light switch for both ends of the hallway. So there were many times where you'd turn off the light and run away scared because it was dark, um, or, you know, insert the blank. But one day, I was probably no older than eight, maybe seven. No older than seven or eight. And I remember coming upstairs, and we have this big old house. And so the stairs are creaky. Everything's a little creaky. You can hear when someone's coming. But I was going upstairs, and I got to the top, and I took a right. And I think I was probably headed to the bathroom or like the other side of the hallway. Because I go, and instead of going straight to my bedroom, I start rounding the corner. 
And all of a sudden, out jumps my sister going, ah! And, you know, we've all had a jump scare time and time again, you know, here and there. But this particular instance, you know, you think, fight or flight. What did I do? Did I fight? Did I flight? Did I run away? What did I do? Well, I actually got so scared, I screamed at the top of my lungs, and involuntarily, I just sat down. <laughs> just, ah, ah, and, and sat right down, crisscross, just in cowering in fear. And once the shock ran up, like ran out, and I got my senses about me, we both laughed and had a great time, and it was totally ridiculous. I wasn't too mad at her. But uh, why am I telling you this? <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is because today we're going to talk about how we are an army. We are an army. And something that we need to understand is that we have an enemy who's fighting against us. Right? We have an enemy who's fighting against us against us. You know, last week we talked about being a bride, and some of, I'm sure some of the guys were like, okay, all right, how does this apply to me? How do I apply this to my life, Pastor Tony? Well, maybe some of you ladies are thinking, all right, we're an army. We can, we can talk about man stuff today. Well, no. Listen, we want to know what Scripture talks about and how we need to relate to God, Right? Would you rather relate to God on your own opinions or would you rather relate to him in truth through the scripture? Amen? So that's what we're going to do today. We're an army and we are fighting an enemy and we have to know about it. Genesis 4, verse 7, God has this interesting conversation with Cain. And God tells him, you know, Cain and Abel both brought sacrifices uh, to God and Cain's offering was some of the harvest of his crop, but it wasn't the first, and it wasn't the best. It was just some of his crops, whereas Abel brought the best. He brought the first. He brought a, a lamb, and, and it was a much different, it was an acceptable sacrifice where Cain's was not, and his count, it says his countenance fell. He went away dejected, and God is saying, Cain, you will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, watch then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. So there's this interesting picture that God uses in Genesis chapter 4, mind you. We're dealing with the first family on earth. And even in Genesis chapter 4, God himself is saying, watch out. Sin is crouching at your door. And, his and its desire is to have you. So you need to be on guard. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it's a similar verse. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. We have an enemy. And even Jesus in John chapter 10, what did he say? He said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. If we don't understand that we have an enemy, we will eventually find ourselves pounced on and paralyzed where he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy anything he can get his hands on in our lives. Can I get an amen? And the thing is, if we, you know, we have, to, we have to be aware of this because if we walk blissfully ignorant and just say, eh, eh, it's no big deal, we don't want to be caught off guard like I did. My sister was, Proverbs talks about how enemies lie in wait for blood. <laughs> ah! <laughs> My sister wasn't lying in wait for blood, but but the, the the picture 
You know, we are not just a hospital, right? We are a hospital. We, we, as the body of Christ, we're a place where people can come and get restored and healed and set free. But we're not just that, right? And we're not just a family, a place to grow and mature and to multiply, a place for health and covenant relationships. We're not just the bride of Christ. We're an army. Revelation 19, and you know what? I, I want to I wanna correct something. Last week, I said, speaking of tattoos, I said that Jesus has tattooed faithful and true on his thigh. The Bible doesn't say that. It says written. It says written on his, on his robe and on his thigh. So I just wanna, I wanna correct my words because I, I don't want you to know my opinion. I want you to know scripture. So I'm sorry for, for, for saying that Jesus had a tattoo because he do, it, says, it says written. Well, huh? No, I, I'm, I'm just kidding. I do, but, but that's, that's a value. I, I wanna correct that openly and honestly, because it's like we want to live by the truth. And even if I get it wrong, I want to bring that to you guys and say, hey, I missed that. So if we're caught off guard, we will inevitably be paralyzed and sit in fear. Have you ever wondered, why is this happening to me? Have, has anybody been in a situation like that where you're wondering, why is this happening to me? And if you don't understand, sometimes God takes us through certain things to, to refine us, to test us, to make us better. And sometimes we are being attacked by the enemy of our souls. And if we aren't able to discern those two, we will attribute evil to God and we will miss the lessons learned when he has us going through one of those growing trials. Right? I mean, you read the whole book of Job and the most of the entire book is his, is his, are his friends and himself and his poor wife <laughs> Ladies, support your husband even in the hard times. Don't be like Job's wife and say, well, why don't you just curse God and die? Um, don't, that's bad advice. Um, but almost the entire book is just people's opinions. And you know what it says? It's, it says later when God starts to talk to Job, when God starts to respond to Job, what does God say? He says, you know, my translation's more literal, but it's like, gird yourself like a man. Basically, get, buckle up, buddy, because we're going to have a conversation. And when we don't understand who our enemy is and who God is, we will get all mixed up. And we'll be rebuking things that are tests and, and trials and seasons that we need to grow from and we'll be rejecting things that God wants us to take us through. You know, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, so we are not just a hospital. We're not just a family. We're not just a bride. We are an army, and we need to stand and fight. Don't be like me. Don't cower and sit down and be paralyzed. Fight, right? My first point today is we are a people of warfare. We are a people of warfare. We're talking about a kingdom culture. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 12. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He wouldn't say that unless it was necessary to, for us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Right? Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Look at these, look at these words that Paul uses when he's talking to the church uh, in Ephesus. He says, put on the full armor of God. He's, you know, they know what a Roman soldier looks like. 
They know all the pieces of armor. They know, I mean, Rome was a very thoroughly militarized uh, civil, civilization. Um, so they would, have, they would have seen this very regularly. And he's saying, you need to take your stand against the devil's schemes. That doesn't sound passive to me, right? He's talking about for our struggle. That doesn't sound like smooth sailing to me, right? We need to understand that there is an enemy that does, would desire for us to be stolen from, killed, and destroyed. He's looking for someone to devour. And that's, guys, that's why it's so important that we stick together as the body of Christ. You know, they were studying, you know, uh, predators will often go after the young, the weak, and the lame in a herd of other animals. And you know what they found? They were studying zebras because zebras, you know, with their natural, natural fur, they, they, you know, blend together. But what is interesting is I can't exactly remember the context, but they were studying this concept of a herd mentality, and they actually wanted to see, um, they wanted to see how this, this phenomenon worked. And so they actually marked one of the zebras with a red mark. And that alone, a healthy zebra, marked with a red mark, was enough for the lions to pick that zebra out and devour it. It wasn't lame. It wasn't left behind. It wasn't a youngling. You know, it was just sticking out. And we, as the body of Christ, need to stick together. We are hidden in Christ. Christ is our identity. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our security. Christ is where we belong and thrive in. Amen? And it's not, I mean, the message isn't don't stick your head out because you'll get got. The message is our identity needs to be found in Christ. The more, you know, what did John the Baptist say? He must increase and I must decrease. We need to have people see more of Christ and less of us for our own benefit. Amen? We are a people of warfare. Take your stand. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's saying stand and fight. There's a struggle going on and we need to fight. Psalm 144, 144, 144, verse 1 said, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. He's not talking about scrapbooking. You know what I mean? Right? You know, and something that we need to understand is we have three enemies. We have three enemies. And th if you get nothing else from this sermon this morning, I want you to understand this. We have three enemies. There's the devil and the powers of darkness. The enemy of our soul, the Bible says. The accuser. Satan. He's the one that prowls around like a, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We also have the world. The world system. Romans chapter 12 says, don't be conformed to this world. It's the world system that is opposed to the things of God. G Jesus says in, jo in the book of John that we're supposed to be, we're, we are of the world, but we're not, we're not, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Because the world does not have the things of God in mind. It's actually opposed to the things of God. And the third enemy is there a mirror around here? Is your flesh. Your flesh. It's your sinful nature. It's your selfish desire. It's your desire to gratify yours truly. Right? So it's the devil, the world, and your flesh. Interesting, you know, well, anyways. So we have th three of these en three enemies. And if you know which one you're fighting, you will be very successful. 
Because sometimes we might be rebuking the enemy and like, get off of my finances, devil, get out of here. And it's like, you don't have a budget? You, you waste all your money on stupid decisions and you're lazy and have no self-control. The devil isn't doing anything to your finances. You're doing that to your finances. No amount of rebuking is going to fix your checkbook. It's really quiet. <laughs> right? I was reading Proverbs the other day. Proverbs 24. I'll be just be honest. And I had to like, I got a morning glories or they have that weed, that the vine that grows onto everything. And the front of my house looks like just a morning, a glorious morning. Um, and I was reading Proverbs 24, and it was at, towards the end, it was like, I walked by the sluggard's house. I, wa I walked by the lazy person who had no sense, and I saw vines and nettles overgrown, and their, their wall was disheveled, and bricks had fallen. And I looked, and I perceived it, and it instructed me a little, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little more rolling of the hands, resting of the hands. And poverty will pounce on you like a robber. It's like, I got to weed the front. <laughs> you know, I was convicted by the word of God, and it wasn't the devil. It was me. And it was time management, and it was get the weed whipper and pick the morning glories, right? That's just a, just being transparent here. There goes the neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, folks. Literally, my folks. Um, I live next door to my parents. Um, so, here's the deal. No amount, no amount of rebuking will fix something that obedience and discipline is the solution for. Right? Sometimes we want God to move mountains supernaturally. God, just fix this. Lord, I need a miracle from heaven. And he's saying, just take a shower. <laughs> like, you stink. It's not, you don't need a miracle. Like, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes we are trying to discipline our ways out of things that are a very spiritual matter. We're trying to set ourselves free when it's the anointing of God that needs to break the bondage in our lives. So you need to know, what are you up against? Is this your flesh or is this the devil? Is this just the opposition of the world? You need to know your enemy. But we are people of warfare. James chapter 4, verse 7, what does it say? Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee, for you, f flee from you. He, we have an enemy who we need to fight. And if we're unwilling or we're, we, we want to just f forget the fact that we have these enemies facing us, we will become casualties. Or certain areas of our lives will, right? Right? Jesus is our example, and in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says that, um, 1 John chapter 3, the second part of the verse says that the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Amen? Jesus is our example. He destroyed the works of the devil. How did he do that? Through the cross. Do you realize that Jesus destroyed the works of the devil through the cross, laying down his life, crucifying his flesh? He triumphed over sin and death. He triumphed over the works of the enemy. He destroyed by crucifying his flesh. He destroyed the works of the devil and he conquered the world. Our flesh, the world, the devil. Our three enemies, the cross, 
wipes it out and destroys it all. Amen? He triumphed over sin and death and reigns victorious. He is the Lord of all lords. He is the king of all kings. And he sits enthroned in a place of authority, righteousness, and majesty forevermore. Amen? So how do we fight? How do we fight? It starts by acknowledging that, one, we are in a battle. Hello? Guys, look around our culture. We are in a battle. And we need to know who our enemy is. Because what does it say in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 12? Or excuse, There's no Ephesians chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So it's not against people. Everybody say that. It's not against people. Just like God uses us, you know what? The devil uses people too. Right? And other people, whether they know Christ or not, are both dealing with the world and their flesh. We are an army, people made to fight. The second thing, how do we do this? We are people under authority. We already read this, but submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It starts with submit therefore to God. Just like an army, there's rank and file, and we have a commander-in-chief that we need to come under. Right? And his name is Jesus. Before we can resist the devil, we have to submit ourselves to God. In the book of Acts, there's a story about these, uh, called the seven sons of Sceva. And they were running around trying to cast demons out of people using Jesus' name, but they didn't know Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches about and some other folks. They didn't know Jesus. They weren't under authority. And it actually says that the demon-possessed person beat them all up and they ran naked. Seven people. Because they weren't under authority. So they had no authority. My question this morning is, are you submitted to God? How about that checkbook? Or are you doing your own thing? Right? 2 Timothy 2.4, Paul's talking to Timothy, a young pastor in the church of Ephesus, He's giving him encouragement. He says, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul's telling Timothy, Listen, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier for Christ. And he tells him, No soldier entangles himself in the things of everyday life. That word entangles, what that literally means is for, it's like, it's a picture of your sword getting stuck. And you are rendered ineffective because you're tangled up in the cares and the worries of everyday life. So as soldiers for Christ, we can't get caught up in every single this and that. Because what it does, you know, what is our sword as believers? We just read it earlier today. It's the Word of God. When we are caught up in every single thing that's going on, and we neglect the Word of God, it's like it renders us ineffective. And our sword gets tangled. Don't get entangled in the affairs of life. But we, we behave so that we can please the one who enlisted us. Who is that but Christ? We're living to please Jesus. Amen? Our aim is to please the one who enlisted us, and we're not going to get tangled. But there is power when we come under God's authority and leadership because God's ways are higher than our ways. Amen? God's ways are better than our ways. Think about how, like, just think about this. How did God 
defeat the enemy and gain total victory. From the outside, it looks like a total failure. He gave up his life. He died shamefully on a cross. He endured one of the most crippling defeats and endured such shame and scorn from people. We would have never chosen, chose that as our, as our battle strategy. This is what we're going to do. We're going to go in there and our, and our chief guy, he's going to mercilessly be beaten and die. And that's going to gain us victory. It's like, hello, we wouldn't have picked that. And that's why it's so important that we come under God's authority because his ways are way better than our ways. Amen? What did Peter say? No, no, Jesus, you're not going to get crucified. No, 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 no. That, no, 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 no. What did Jesus tell him? Get behind me, Satan, for you don't have the things of God in mind but the things of this world. And when we think with, in, in just worldly thinking, we miss godly thinking. We miss the way God wants to do things. And that's why it's so important that we come under his authority and his way of doing things, and we come in, under him and obey him and follow him. And even if we don't like the way it looks, we, we follow him anyways. Because it's way better to follow Christ into the darkness because he is the light. Amen? Because yeah. even darkness is light to him. You know, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. What? That doesn't sound like a battle strategy. That doesn't sound like how we're going to conquer our enemies. Like, that's not the win. That's admitting defeat. Not in the kingdom. Not in the kingdom. If we're not submitted under his authority, we miss out on how he wants to work in us and through us. Even Jesus, you look at John 6, 38, even Jesus did what his father was doing. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Guys, that's Jesus. Look at the story of the centurion in Matthew chapter 8. A couple verses here. It says, the centurion, this, this Roman soldier, came to Jesus because one of his servants was sick and was going to die. And he was asking for, for Jesus to heal him. It says, but the centurion said, and Jesus said, I'm willing, let's go. Let's go to your house. We'll, I'll, I'll heal your servant. And the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. That's humility. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also, isn't that interesting? Also. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and he does it. Verse 10, now when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Man, because this, this Roman soldier got it. He perceived by faith I mean, even by faith, he perceived that Jesus was able to work miracles because he was serving a higher authority. Jesus, who is God, was walking in the authority of his Father. I mean, and Jesus recognizes that. We are all in a battle, and we're all going to fight. That's just a given. The difference will be found by whose authority you are under. We can either follow Christ and have him be the authority that we're accountable to that is fighting for us, or we put ourselves as our own authority. And let me tell you, if you put yourself as your own master, you're sorely mistaken because it's not you. You're serving another 
Third thing, we are a people of victory. Ephesians 6.13 says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand, to remain standing. We stand firm because whose armor is it? It's God's armor. I mean, you go through the Old Testament and you see all these articles and items that are mentioned. Several of them are in the book of Isaiah. The robe of, the, the belt of truth, the robe of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. We can stand firm because it's not our armor. Because we're submitted under his authority. It's God's armor and it's God's victory. When we're under his authority, we get to walk with his authority and that is the victory. Amen? 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? He gives us the victory through him through him. The good news is that through Christ, we have the victory. He has made us new creations, but we have to put on that armor, right? Put on the armor. Put on Christ. I mean, if you just go through it, the belt of truth, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. God's truth should hold everything together. Amen? His truth should be the center point of our lives. And it's the very foundation that holds us all together. Amen? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? The breastplate of righteousness. We wear God's righteousness. We are hidden in Christ, and He covers us and makes us holy when we're hidden in him. And then it talks about feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. You know, you can stand firm when your hope is in the gospel. When your efforts are not on, when your hope is not on your own efforts and when your security is not on what you can accomplish and in what Christ accomplished, there's peace. Peace. Amen? He's the Prince of Peace. Galatians 3, 27 talks about how... Uh, you want to put up Galatians 3? Galatians three twenty seven says, For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Again, in Romans 13, 14, it says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. How do we crucify our flesh? How do we resist the enemy? We have to put on that new nature. We have to put on Christ and let that identity be the primary thing speaking over our lives. Amen? Last thing, Ephesians 4.22 through 24. It says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lusts and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. We have to put off the old and put on Christ. Amen? We have to realize that we're in a battle. We're in a war. Whether we're fighting or not, my, suggest, my suggestion is to fight. Don't roll over. But we have to come under God's authority. Amen? And when we do that, we get to fight from a position and place 
of victory of what he accomplished on the cross. Amen? Let me leave you with this last thought. Uh, Some of you know this story in Exodus. Uh, I think it's, I forget the, the people, but in Exodus, when they're coming out of Egypt, there's this situation, oh man, I forget the, forget the the nation. But there's a situation where they have to fight. And so Moses goes up on this mountain and he puts his staff in the air. Who? The Midianites? Is it? He holds up his staff because the Lord instructs that if he keeps his staff raised up, they will have victory. Joshua and the army of Israel will have victory as they fight down below in the valley. And so Moses holds up this staff, and he's holding this staff, and he's holding this staff, and they're gaining the victory, but every time he lowers the staff because his arms are getting tired, they, Joshua and the army of Israel begin to lose. Amalekites? The Amalekites. And so Aaron and Hur come alongside Moses, and they actually sit and brace his arms up. So Moses can keep the staff lifted up so they can have victory. And this, I believe, is just a picture of our identity in Christ. When we keep, we sang it this morning, we lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age he reigns. His kingdom has no end. When we lift up the name of Jesus over our lives, we are in a war. We are going to have to fight. But we're coming under his authority, and we fight from a place of victory where it's guaranteed because of the price, not that we earned, but the price that he paid. Amen? And when we keep that banner high, when we keep the staff lifted up, we will walk in victory. It doesn't mean that we don't have to fight because we will. Until we see him face to face, you will have to fight through things. There will be hard and difficult seasons of your lives and there are real things that we are fighting now, but we get to fight from a place of victory. Amen? Why, Why do we pray against sickness and disease? Why do we pray for healing? Because Christ paid the price. And do we always see it? No, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, but we always hold that banner high because we believe that Christ paid the price for it. So we keep believing it. We keep walking it out. We keep calling on his promises and saying, Jesus, you paid with your blood and we're taking you seriously at your word because you paid the price for us. So we hold this banner high and we're going to get tired, but we keep it up. And we get people in our lives that can encourage us and come alongside of us and say, no, that's not who you are. You're starting, to, you're starting to drop that. You're starting to see yourselves in your own eyes. What did Gideon, he's this terrified person hiding in the wine press. What did the angel of the Lord say to Gideon? Hey, mighty warrior. He's like, I'm nobody. Go in this strength. You're going to do great. It's like sometimes we need to see what God thinks about us. What God thinks about our situation. And we need to hold his victory high. And you know what? Every time that came down, it's like every time we put that down, we still have to fight, but we're fighting in our own strength. We're trying to accomplish our own problems. We're like Joshua down in the valley trying to do it ourselves, and you don't want to do that. Raise his banner over your lives. Whether it's, I mean, whether it's sickness, disease, depression, addictions, whatever it is, whatever you're going through, whether it is finances, whether you do need help, whether it is your relationships, whether it is your children at home, whatever is going on, Jesus paid with his blood that we would walk in his promises, that we would come under his leadership and his authority and raise that banner over our lives. Amen? So let's stand and pray. Some of us in this room, man, 
Some of us in this room are like Moses on the mountain, and we realize things are consequential. We realize there's a battle being waged and being fought, but we're tired. You're tired. And you're trying. It's like, yeah, I know. I know. I know this is who, this is who the Bible says I am. And it's a lot like the, the man whose child needed healing from Jesus. And Jesus said, just believe. And it's like the heart of a father. It's like, I believe, but I'm having a hard time. Help my unbelief. I'm trying, but I need help. We want, we want as a church to stand with you to be Aaron and her for you today. So if you would like prayer, after we pray, I'd like you to come forward. And there's going to be, if we could have just a leadership team come up here. We want to believe God with you and help raise that banner over your life. Amen? Because there's, there's one thing God never intended for us to walk through life alone. It's just not how he designed us to be. It is not good that man be alone. So, we are in a war. And we got to fight. But we're going to come under the authority of the King of Kings who won the victory. Amen? So let's pray together. And if that's you, I just want you to come forward and we want to believe God with you and pray with you. So Father... Lord, we come before you, and God, we thank you <laughs> that death itself has lost its stick. Lord, that our greatest enemy is gutted in, fa in the face of your victory. Lord, we thank you that you conquered sin and death, and every bondage an addiction or trauma that has gone on in any of our lives or even the little things, Lord, even the little things. God, that you conquered it all. Lord, and you won the victory. Father, help us to come under your authority that we would be able to walk in your victory, Lord. God, we thank you for all of your promises that are in Christ. They are yes and amen. Lord, we believe you and we trust you and we ask that you would help us to walk with you each and every day, Father. Lord, I pray that you would help us to represent you well. Help us to fight the good fight of faith. Lord, help us to put on Christ. Lord, help us to put on that armor of God. Lord, that it's your armor, that it's your victory, that it's you who is making us ready to see you face to face, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. If that's you, please come forward. We want to pray with you.